conditions. Um, for this one, I like to use a bank account because everyone loves money. So imagine 
imagine you're depositing a dollar into your bank account. At the same time, someone else is taking out five dollars out of your bank account. So what would you expect your final result to be? Should be hopefully four or less. But what happens if this is not protected here? So he reads, we're at five dollars. He reads, we're at five dollars. Sweet. We each deposit a dollar. Before that happens, this guy says, oh, I took out five dollars. So therefore, he reads zero. He's at six. Who writes last is actually going to win this. So if your withdrawal comes out last, you're going to be stuck at zero when you should be at four or one, whatever it is. I mean, yeah. Any questions on this? Because this is probably the biggest issue with gold variables. I want to make sure this is good. It's the remodify rise most common. There's other weird types of race conditions, but that's the most common. So there's the head. So proper use. First, let's talk about some benefits. They are simple. It cannot be much simpler than create a little variable, the I, put a data type on it, drag it onto your block diagram, and use it. And they are actually quite fast. They are very, very fast to read and write. <coughs> um, this is a little trick that I actually taught Nancy this one. You can actually use it as a debug window. <coughs> you can actually have this debug window, have this flow variable sitting around. And in development, you can actually see your values change as you read and write to them. So it's next, next little debug tool. No proper use. Read, I'm oh sorry, write only once to your global variable. Global variable should only have one place you're writing to it. If you're writing to more than one place, you better make sure they cannot execute at the same time. Otherwise, you will run into those fun race conditions. Uh, my typical case for this, configuration data. I read from a config file, I write those two global variables, and then they're like constants floating around for the rest of the code. Um, test stats, pass fail, beautiful for that. Calibration coefficients, I've done plenty of those as well. And here's an interesting one, or like none, read many. You can actually save your defaults in the global variable itself. And then it's literally a constant as long as all you're doing is and here's where I want some conversation going. Any other uses out there that people like to use? Or even tricks to avoid the disadvantages? I'll yes. say one thing that I found out recently. Um, pipe thefts do not work on RT systems, dual variables. Really? Yes, I have a problem with that. So apparently, type thefts and global variables don't match on an RT system. There's an option to uh, detach uh, type thefts in your build configuration for RT. Okay. But that can run into other problems with some other GIs where they require type depth on them. So it's when you detach them in the build. So, so if you detach them, it works with global variables. But if you have some other uh, LabVIEW uh, GIs, uh, sometimes those require type depths in them. So I ran a case where if I had the type depths enabled, my global variables that uh, had uh, for type depth uh, caused the application not to even launch, so I can't even debug into it at all. And then if I disable the type depths, um, some other BI would run at home to require the type depths, and so it wouldn't launch. What version of LabVIEW? Uh, 2014 SP1. Which RTOS are you working with? Um, this is the 1H1. Okay. It didn't do a nice thing that if I had the UI, it did pop up a nice error message that told me that it was looking for a specific type depth mm -hmm. that wasn't there. Well, that's nice. It did. <laughs> After enabling the UI <laughs> on the RT system. So the 39 or 930X? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's embedded real time. Right? Yep. I might I just say that because that might be part of the problem. Like it's, I have not ran that myself. Okay. Um, any others? Yes, John. Um, user preferences. Uh, like do something similar to your write once uh, allow them to rewrite them if they modify the user preferences. Yes. Updating the, the, the XML file I saw those the same time. So it basically store the user preferences. <coughs> so you basically have a dialog come up that sets the user preferences, and that will overwrite the global, the global variable. That makes sense because only one place can still write them at a time. And it's just one default saying, yep, good spot. Yes? You said they were fast. Are they good for deterministic systems? 
how deterministic do you need is the first question. And how fast do you really need? Faster than four milliseconds. Four milliseconds are probably fine. Uh, I don't think I've actually done Milliseconds is a long time, especially if you go to an RT system. When I look at some bigger range, it's maybe not enough. Bigger, well, you'll find bigger range are not as good as the variables, they, which I'll get to that a little while later. Um, we talk about turning this. Um, but my experience is I have had no problems with excessive trader with goal variables, because they just tend to be fast. Uh, locals are going to be about the same. You might want to consider an RT5, though, but it depends on data rates and everything else that you're looking at. Tag data, you're probably fine with just the global. Any other? Now, Nancy, you were tough. I remember when we had the review, you were telling me something about saving private, make the goal private, and then make the ISA access it. Yeah, and it was, it's a global variable, make the global variable, put it in a project, and make it private. Because once the global variable is in a project and it's private, no one can use the global variable. And then you put your wrapper methods in that project as well, and set them up to be protect kind of the critical sections of the code so it's not just a get or a set. Um, but then you basically have a library, but no one can illegally use the global variable because it's private. So basically you use a private, make the global variable private and a library. And only the eyes in that library can access it. Exactly. And then you have to make sure you're protecting the critical sections still, which is that adds to the tracking uh, test. The re remod by right. So as long as you're still doing that, they're quite effective. Any other? That's all for All right. Let's talk about alternatives now. Single process shared variables. I pretty much shun away from shared variables because, well, they came out with CloudView 8.0, and who remembers 8.0? <laughs> exactly. Uh, I don't need to say anymore. Uh, but they're actually also created inside a library, CloudView library. Uh, uh, I don't remember which version, but they changed it so they actually have to be in a project and use them. Uh, they do have RT capabilities as well. Uh, and what I don't recommend is make them network publish shared variables, because I've had nothing but horror stories with those. Only once have I actually had good luck with them, and that was on my CLED exam. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they are, I actually found in my benchmarks is that they were actually faster than the global variable. Enough to say that they're faster on my PC at least. Um, one nuance I found is you can't make them private. I don't know if that's a problem that and I just missed or if it's actually a function of the shared variable. Um, so beware of that one. I would imagine it does because I'm guessing at this part, so if someone from now can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's a global variable, global variable, global variable is actually a VI and it's just right into it, so it actually still has to write to the front panel for the global variable. So I imagine if you have the front panel open, somebody has to take time to write that up. I saw a question back there. I was just saying repeat the question because I couldn't hear it. Oh, uh, if you have the front panel of the global variable open, is it actually slower? Like I, said, I think it does, just because you have to you have to draw an image on the front panel of the block of the global variable. I did not test that though. I'll let you worry about that in your class. <laughs> Action engines. Action engines are pretty much bread and butter in my life. I have abused these to the extreme. Um, I have to give credit to Ben, who has written the nugget ever best nugget ever. There's a link to it if when you get this get this presentation from online, hit that link because you will learn something. Um, but basically it works as a non-reentrant VI. For those who don't know non-reentrant means only one copy of that VI is in existence in memory. Um, so basically the VI itself acts as the blockage for your remod by right. So in this case we're just doing an increment. Uh, 
I just realized I screwed up my VI. Oh, well. <laughs> that ship director should be on initialized. That was an edit I made before. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, so it should be a tunnel coming down here to add it. Uh, hmm. Yeah, so that's what you should use to do that goes in. No, there is actually an argument of shift registers for feedback nodes, and Stephen Mercer is in here. Nope. Um, oh, you're inside here. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> He's hiding. Because I remember this last year or something, you decided to actually throw, go through the benchmarks of the shift registers for the feedback nodes, and the feedback nodes came slightly faster. Slightly. Barely enough to actually care. Um, so, Preference, pretty much, you can use the while loop with, with the shift register uninitialized or the feedback node. But the idea is you protect your, your uh, read mod by write section in there. <coughs> Functional global variables, I am defining this as an action engine that is just a get and a set. I do not want to be in arguments of what an actual functional global variable is. That is my definition for this talk. So you have a get and a set. So Brian Powell, is he in here? Don't worry, I don't get to embarrass him. Um, he actually had a nice art blog for a while from the, I don't remember what's the name of the blog, I saw my name now. Um, he had a great article on how race conditions and functional global variables were somehow related. Because somewhere, someone said, I use a functional global variable, therefore I eliminate race conditions. And he's like, where did that come about? Uh, somewhere in training, basically, paragraphs got pissed. That's basically what I came into. But basically, if you're doing a get set, you are not protecting your critical section. <coughs> All you're doing is really getting the value and saying the value. And whatever you modify in between is a race condition. So it's literally the same as a global variable. So my pet peeve number two in LabV world do not use a freaking functional global variable. They are slow. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> so I know my pet, no, my pet peeve number one is the value property node. Been through that one many times. Any questions on this? Because this is, like I said, this is my pet peeve number two, so I want to make sure it's hammered home. Right, are, you are, you slower, are you saying it's slower than a, than a global variable? It's actually a lot slower than a global variable. And I, I'll pull up the base parts a little later to show, to show you. Dimitri? And I was just asking about numbers. Yeah, I'll, I have a slide with this. Um, when I get to the end of I'll turn this. Per value table. Uh, this is actually an applic. Sorry, it's a uh, library developed by NI Systems Engineering. It is not shipped with Lab, so you have to install it through the IPM. Um, well, it's great for when you don't know what tags you need out there in the world, it uses a string to look up what tag you're trying to find. So it's great for dynamic situations. And they also have an XML interface if you want to do that. Um, and that's fast to be installed. Actually, it's, top, it's built on top of an action engine, if anyone cares. But it's a great library. Is anyone from system engineering in here? Ah, sheepishly. <laughs> you can be proud of this one. I love this this one. It is cool. Yes. This one and STM are my two favorites. All right, here's where we get into some interesting ones. A little background from before I even started with LabVIEW. Um, someone along the lines came up with this genius idea of using a queue that can only hold one element. And what you do, after you initialize it, you dequeue yeah, you DQ your element. What happens if someone else is trying to access it? There's no element to DQ, therefore it's locked down there until you're done modifying and you enqueue it back into the queue. So basically you have a reference to global variable. Once I actually figured out that's what was happening, I was like, that is ingenious. Then in 2009, and I came out with the data value reference. So basically, you have actually a structure now that actually holds your critical section of your data. And it's still a reference being passed around. And it can eliminate your race condition. It is beautiful. Um, I have to find it to be more extendable than your action engine, just because you can do 
more things inside or more different <coughs> things inside. So the action engine you're pretty much limited to however many inputs you can put on your front panel. This one, but you can make a VI that does whatever you want to. <coughs> I recommend being on a library, by the way. Um, and Steve Watts actually pointed this out to me. They work very well for big, large data sets, like huge arrays, big clusters. They are a lot faster with those. Uh, and one little trick I had, I, well, I use a DVR actually stored on global variables so that way I can get it from anywhere without passing the wire everywhere. It works until you close it. <coughs> <laughs> Any questions on these? Yes. Uh, single element P versus uh, Semaphore. Semaphore is actually built on top of a single element Q. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so is the configuration of the eyes, if you ever care. But you kind of have multiple regions, right? Once one part of the region is gone. Right, once the element is gone, then the other one cannot read it until the new element is in Q.A. Right, so couldn't do a single write or multiple. Correct. Only yeah, because only one can write uh, or read it at a time. So multiple people can't read it. That's the question. Well, no, you can read Q. That's the thing. Oh yeah, you can't do a Q preview. Oh, right. <coughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, my benchmark showed that DVR was actually quite a bit faster, so I recommend going bit. Any other comments? Yes. Basically, if, what he's saying is if you do the have a huge, large data set in your queue, then single on the queue, and you do a preview, you are making a copy of that huge, giant array or data set, whatever. That can be slow and memory intensive. So if you're doing the read, modify, write, it's all in line. You use the same memory space. Yeah? One other comment on your DVR. If you have a DVR created in a dynamically called VI and it closes lab, you will not so intelligently kill the DVR for you and leave your references thinking. So if you dynamically create a DVR and then suddenly no, kill if, if you're dynamically launching a VI like you yeah, use the call by reference you're dynamically calling a VI that makes a DVR. And then that once that DVI, once that VI has closed, LiveVD says, oh, you're done with this DVR. Yes, that is a caveat that it's happened several times in the forums lately. If you dynamically call a VI and, it and it's the one that creates the DVR, as soon as that VI goes out of, of memory, so does your DVR. So anyone else accessing that DVR? Gone. Can't do it. Steve? Depends on how you dynamically call it. Use the call by reference node to find. Because the call by reference node is treated as a sub VI call, whereas the run VI method or the async call by route fire and forget is, se is a separate VI hierarchy. So it's a static dynamic call? Yeah. So you use a stack dynamic call and it's treated as a sub VI. Therefore, it stays in the, <coughs> the main higher memory hierarchy keeps it. My use case was the async call. Yeah, so the asynchronous call, you're going to have that problem. That's also not unique to DVRs. Yeah, that's actually any reference, is what I have discovered. Q DVR. Yeah, Q DVR, file IO, name it, it's a problem. Any other comments? I expect a more lively launch. <laughs> yeah, it's right after launch, you know. Uh, so you're actually talking <coughs> numbers. So here's when I did my benchmarks. Uh, so local variables were, yeah, 1.2. Uh, so this for a single i32, I think is what I used. And this was a very large of, I think, 1 million data points array. So there's your numbers of how the DVR actually stacks up once you actually go to a large data set. It's a lot faster than anything else. Yeah, it's fire up. I didn't try it with single element because there's so much. Yeah, the DVR is actually like three times faster than single element Q. It's like yes. a war, it's a global. Real time secondary optimization. So global 
I have a difficulty. I know word global and I know word DVR, but I have no idea about abbreviation between them. What are the other abbreviations? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, single process shared variable, functional global variable, uh, current value table, action engine, single element queue, then data value reference. Oh yeah, that's the race condition. I actually have a version of this VI actually posted out on ni.com uh, to just do a search for race condition, or a look at race conditions is actually what I call it. Um, you'll get a version of this. So basically, I have, that's cool too. That's easy. Benchmarking using the high relative uh, second. That's initialized. Then we have two loops <coughs> in parallel, adding the value 25 times. So ideally, you should get 50 in the end. And then I just get the value at the end, and I get the max min of how high you actually got and what the deviation was, uh, mean, <coughs> and apply as well, apply histogram as well. And this is the one I ran right before the session. <laughs> So the idea here is global variable, let's see our item. Actually, I want to get only add up to 18. That sounds like a problem. It's, um, and basically, I worked my way down that up, all these would cause race conditions, and then the action engine down. You fix it because you get the re-modify right, protect it. So you do not. Questions, comments? I did not try that. Um, some actually did. I took a, uh, a VM with only one core. And actually, they all turned out to be 50. And I was scratching my head, like, what just happened? I'm back to my opinion for processor thought again. So, But I thought, nah, it's not modern day, because everything is multi-core now. Everything runs in parallel perfectly now. You need to be aware of this, these race conditions even more now <laughs> than ever. And if you want to know more about benchmarking and everything I did wrong with my benchmarking, <laughs> Christian Altenbach and Ed Dickens, I saw you somewhere in here. Uh, is it tomorrow at 4.15? 4.15, right in this room. They get to end it. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Yes? Come with you tomorrow. <coughs> Me and Mike. Yeah. Yeah, probably right. Yeah, all right. I can do this one. Is that needed? I'm needed. Okay. Push us as far as you can. We're hoping for a fire. One, two, three. Okay. You're good. So I come from a software engineering background, and uh, I do large systems and a lot of reusable code libraries, and using global variables, specifically in anything like this structure, because these are singletons. They have their place, but if you're trying to write reusable code, this is a disaster. Yes. It couples reusable, reusable units to each other. You cannot just simply take code from one project, pull it into the other, and hope it will work. I, had, uh, I have a customer who used the template from an eye to write a producer-consumer thing. Producer was the GUI, and consumer was the execution engine, and two loops. And, and I used the global variable to communicate a stop command between the loops. So it was fine while we're, you're running a development environment, just one instance. But then he copied this application, made another one, and deployed them. And people were running them in dev environment. And suddenly you hit a button on stop button one, and the other closes too. <laughs> yeah. That's a nice example. Yeah. yeah, so singletons, they have their place, but you have to be really, really careful when you use them. Yeah. And, and if you're writing something larger than 100 VIs, <coughs> think twice before you use singletons. 
Am I the only one who remembers the good old days of LabVIEW 2, where if you like had a problem of which the execution order was, you could just nudge one over a little to the left, and it was totally deterministic? <laughs> <laughs> I might have to just, just defer you, but they, they do allow inputs to sub BIs for the, for the channel. So therefore, you can pass literally a wire between two BIs and you can still run parallel video channels. It's data flow rethought. <laughs> when I first heard about this, I was like, what? And my mind was like, mm. <laughs> yes, these are completely in parallel. Notice there's no tunnel to show up there. alternatives I missed. Because I know there's some out there that I just haven't found yet. Variant attributes, file. Variant attributes? Well, how are you passing the data, though? How are you passing the variants, though? I love variant attributes, but it doesn't fit here, sorry. They store the value in the variant, but then how do you transfer it over? Yeah, but then how you pass it between the loops? Yes? If you speak about shared experience, uh, I found, uh, and uh, I already talked about uh, another se session, I use global variables with multiple writers. 
I said, last step when I need to shut down the system on emergency situation. Yeah, you usually e stop. I'm right if stop. everything is crashed and some process are still running in the background. Yeah. So this is the way. If some process knows there is a there is a alarming situation, <coughs> everything should be shut down so soon as possible. There is a special global variable which shoots everything. But otherwise I completely completely agree with Dmitry. Global variables are really working very often against one of three basic rules of good programming. It is extendability. Yes. You create a great program with global variables and after that cu customer comes and say, I don't, I don't want one channel, I need one channel, uh, two channels. Give yes. me two channels, exactly, exactly the same code, just two channels. And you have to rewrite all, all the code because you use global variables. So just to summarize, global variables do not extend well. As soon as you add one more channel, they're copying all your globals, just to use that new channel. And you have to keep adding it. Yes? How about threads in threads? Say, global threads are not threads. So how about the multi thread environment? Is there any performance? I always switch in between. I don't know about actually swap. They're all happening inside the Clavio application. I do, and they do use the term. Um, that's usually has to do with your remodel I write is typically where that's coming in. So if basically you have to protect that remodel I write process, and when that's protected, then your thread safe. Uh, the goals themselves, I would actually say they're thread unsafe. You showed that. You showed that. Yeah. That's yeah. Racing. So yeah. That's, that's, that's your that's, that's, your, that's your hallmark of being thread unsafe. Yeah. That you're subject to race conditions. And so yeah, they are explicitly thread unsafe. Yeah. So you take measures. Side communication, redefine or once, three many. That's the only time you should be using global variables. And yes, there are little caveats you have to watch out. So they break data flow. So if you can't use data flow, please use data flow. I cannot emphasize that more. And if I can't, then Steven will take over because that's what he puts at the end of every single presentation. You gotta watch out for, for racing. But yes, more comments. Please. One more comment. One more comment, okay. <laughs> global variables are your best friends on FPGA targets. They don't they consume FPGA resources. And the worst thing you can get is arbitration, which introduces a bit of cheaper. But otherwise, they're great. So that's, wow. I didn't know they were use no resources. I thought they still used a little bit. Just wire. The global variables apparently on FPGA are free, as far as hardware is concerned. But you do have to watch out because you can cause arbitration jitter, and you still have your race condition problem. Right back there. How about notifiers? I put notifiers under the messaging. They're not really tags. Because tags are persistent. They, once you write them, they stay there. Notifiers, once you read it, it's gone. Well, in that one spot, once you read it. I'll, I'll have to play with that. <laughs> My experience is once I read it, it sits there and waits for a new notification. Yes? Notifiers are good for state data. You can have some groups that ignore the notifications until they're ready, and they get the most recent version. But if no of them might want to use it more often, that's what the solution would say. So it's really good for just populating state and process. Notifiers are good for letting <coughs> everyone else know your current state, is what you're saying. So if you want to push a whole bunch of updates, and your UI only wants to update once a second, and you're, you're updating data anywhere from one second to 150 seconds, mm -hmm. so that you just show it to a notifier, and the oh. UI just checks the notifier gets the Yeah, it only gets the latest notification. Last. Yeah, so basically, notification notifiers, in case you didn't know, are bossy, so it's only the latest notification that was sent is what you'll read. So, yeah, but, that's but that, well, I, I still consider that a mess. It's a lossy message, is why I put that in. It, it is lost, but the advantage is if no data comes in within that second, the UI doesn't update. Right. So it does, you don't spend time pulling. It's right. It's like a, a way of getting away from It's a message. Now, 
I don't do them anymore because I do best based actors now, but I used to use it in the old days before we had all that stuff. Yeah. A lot of stuff has changed. Uh, way in the back. Just for the discussion on another fire, isn't it the same as single element you just reverse them? No. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you can see a notifier is a single element queue with a lossy in queue. That's the closest I can think of pointing. You first try to reach the notifier and if there's nothing, it's just that somebody was out using the queue also. No? Right, but with the lossy queue, you're losing that element just like with the notifier. And then once you read it, it should be gone. Yes, Bab? The notifier can be empty, right? You have the waiting for a notification to be arrived, where the right. single element queue has always to have something in it. So that's the difference. That's when he says no, it's backwards. Uh, no, it's locked. No? No, it, it's locked. It's locked. If there's an element, if there is an element, you're, you're waiting for basically a notification. For the single element queue. Yeah, but the, on the notification, you, you have to wait until there's data available. The single yes. element queue will always have something in it. Yeah. Not if you dequeue, well. No, because <laughs> if you're, you're, you should not be dequeuing yeah. when you read. Right. When you're reading, you, you do, do a preview you. of the queue. If you only dequeue, you're about to write. Yeah, if you just get the status, though. Something will always be there. Yeah. Unless someone else is messing with the data and DQ. But then you're waiting for the data to be available. Can the status actually wait for that? The single element, yeah. I'm learning stuff, that's why I like it. Yes. <laughs> 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 Sorry, yeah. so notifier also has a get status. So if you can use it as a tag like that, I don't know if it's called. The notifier also has a single element queue. Yeah. So if you can use it as a tag like that, I don't know if it's called. Sounds a long time <laughs> yes. comment on the queue status and the notifier status primitives. I have yet to see any use for those two primitives outside of custom probes that isn't a race condition. Um, or like when someone's writing debuggers for getting information. But if it's actually in your final shipping code, I've, I've become incredibly suspicious of it from people trying to say, well, is the queue empty? Then I'll do something. And the queue is immediately filled in by the next operation happening in parallel. So. If you're trying to use it as a tag or something, that's a red flag in my book to, to take a close look at the race conditions of your code. Can you use preview queue or what would you use instead? There's various things you can do, but the queue status and notifier status primitives in particular are generally abused. If, 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 you, if you get something in queue quite rarely, say once per several seconds, and you still have to be able to shut down the process relatively fast. So you need to call queue more often that you get value in queue. Okay. In this case, you have to check the status. No, you or can, you have to check you can on timeout. You DQ with a timeout. There's, there's a number of things, but, I, but specifically trying to query the status as opposed to using some of the other primitives, generally I see, a, I see problems in people's code that try to do that. Yeah, queue status will give you one very particular piece of information, and that's the status of the queue at the very instant in which you ask. It will say nothing about what's going to happen on your subsequent read and or write to the queue. <laughs> so if you really need it to do its job and you know what its job is, then you use it. But like I said, if you, as soon as you start moving away from that, you know, you're going to have trouble. I'm with Steve. I've never had a good queue. I've, I've used it to determine if there's stuff in the queue, and if there's stuff in the queue, I don't queue into it. Like to sort of gate how much stuff I'm putting on the queue. Oh, so you're limiting the queue by using the queue stats. Yeah. 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 But you could actually good. just set your size. Yeah. Size yeah. You the limit the size and then and, and set the timeout yeah. to cool. minus yeah. one. That's yeah, another comment. Well, I'm, I'm doing well, the same kind of thing because I have a memory ingest data, and if, if, at some point I slow down ingesting that data if the other part of the operation is running slowly. 
So there's no reason to load up all the memory I have with data that I can't process. Right. So I, I throttle the loading based on the population. Any others? Talking have multiple global variables on a single global variable BI versus different ones for each one. Yeah. I find it best just to have one. It's easier to maintain. <coughs> and okay. Yes, yeah, so it will load the entire BI global variable. Okay. But like I said, from maintainability, I find it a lot simpler. And you shouldn't be having huge data sets yeah. in there anyway, so it shouldn't be a big deal. Yeah, I would say if, if you're pondering whether or not to have a bunch of individual global uh, VIs versus having a bunch of controls in a single global, I think you would step away from the keyboard and think about the, <laughs> the bigger picture of what you're about to do. I think, yeah. I think one or two might have a place somewhere. But, uh, I've had one of like five, five, but they're all related together and actually thrown into a library and they're actually were privatized, so no one outside that library could get to them. But like I said, they're all related. Of course, and as mentioned, FPGA does break a lot of the rules that we thought we FPGA started to learn. FPGA is a completely yeah. different piece from normal lab. Yeah. Way, way back in the day, and I don't know if it's still the case, actually, if you did have a lot of variables in one global file, it would have impact if you were like, this is if when, this is when people would sprinkle globals everywhere. Yeah, and way uh, back in the day, it was five. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know, you know, that type of thing. I don't know whether it's been modified or dealt with. In fact, it can have an impact on you know, your I overall speed. I do know that, basically the, the comment was that back in the day, if you had a lot of items on the global variable, it would slow it down. Um, I've noticed somewhere along the lines, global variables got extremely fast. So you just, and I did some kind of optimization, so like they became extremely fast. Um, and in, in today's processing, I don't think you're going to have that problem anymore. Anyway. What's the problem with never this is an interesting topic. Um, each time you read from a global variable, you are making a copy of the data, just like with a local variable, uh, or get a stash in Ingram Q. So you are copying data there. Um, every time you write to it, I think it's copying it to the global. So that so you should just have one memory space of the global itself. But the read, I know, does make a copy of the data. Personally, I use the question. I use the uh, repeat the question. Repeat the question. Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Um, basically, what's the alternative to using network public string variables? So basically, you have PC trying to write to your CRIO. How do you get to get data across? These tag data. Um, I use uh, TCP IP or network strings. And I basically use them as messages. And the messages say, here's the latest back. And I have my RT just every 500 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, however long, say, here's my latest back. Here's my latest back. UDP instead, for, it works well for taxes, but UDP is lossy. So you have, so if you have any hard, heavy network traffic, you can move messages. Um, but I prefer just having one connection, so I use TCP. Is I the only one who remembers the good old days of LabVIEW 2 when we didn't have global variables? <laughs> 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 yeah, that's yeah. why, I know exactly, that's why. It's now called a functional global variable. I know, like some of us didn't understand. They're like, wait, that's a lab YouTube bowl. Yes. <laughs> if only I should get it right in my diagram. <laughs> Any others? I think I'm out of time. But. All right. So as soon as Becky shows up. She's got time. Well, let's thank Tim. I mean, that was fun.